WBZ is unique electronic system. You are in contact with the world of excitement on Bob Kennedy's Contact. Well, you know, hardly had Major Kehoe, director of NICAP National Investigating Committee on Aerial Phenomenon, departed Boston a week or so ago, and the balloon really went up out in Michigan. Uh, at least something went up out there, because we have a whole rash of reports of unidentified flying objects that were sighted in the Ann Arbor area. They were seen by farmers, by policemen, the civil defense director, co-eds, roughly about 400 in all. What were they? Well, we'll get some opinions tonight, some from the official Air Force investigator who was sent to the scene, some from Major Kehoe in Washington, and also from that civil defense director in Michigan. And later we'll be hearing from a reporter out there who interviewed any number of eyewitnesses. How about you two? Have you had any sightings lately? You wonder what this thing called the UFO is, what it's all about? I tell you what, this place is liable to explode tonight in electronic mist before the evening is over because we have hooked up a line between Washington and back to Michigan, and Washington will have, for a while, Dick Hall, the assistant director of the National Investigating Committee on Aerial Phenomenon. They will have the civil defense director from Hillsdale, Michigan, Bud Van Horn, on the long-distance line. We'll be here in Boston. We'll have Streeter Stewart with us in a little bit, uh, Streeter from WBZ News, of course, and also a member of NICAP at UNI Line, so we really have something going, and we'll be back getting our conversation underway, but first, let's have this message. Paul, how are you? Fine. Very good. And hello, Bud Van Horn in Michigan. Hello, Bob. Bud, can you hear Dick? I can hear Dick fine. Dick, can you hear Bud? Yes, very well. Okay, off we go then. I think we'll begin with Dick Hall, Bud, if you don't mind, down in Washington. Dick, of course, is the assistant director of the National Investigating Committee on Aerial Phenomenon. Major Kehoe is on his way to Washington, and he'll be joining us a little bit later. But uh, having been involved in these saucer shows, Dick, for about three and a half years here on Contact, Offhand, it seems to me that this is probably one of the, the biggest uh, rash of sightings that I have ever seen in the past three years, anyhow. How does this stack up according to other flaps that you've had? Well, the only one that was comparable to it at all was in November and December of 1957, mm -hmm. and this is, uh, it keeps up at the present pace, we'll outdo that one. We have literally dozens of reports pouring in right now from all over the country. So it's not only Michigan. Not only Michigan, no, they're throughout the south and mm -hmm. far west. There was one up in the map is just uh, prickling with pins. Mm -hmm. Any particular theory as to why? I think uh, the sightings have been going on very steadily since last summer, and mm -hmm. I think the only difference right now is that uh, they got some publicity for a change, and something touched off the wire services and the national... Uh, uh, network people, and therefore uh, it's brought it more out into the open. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, I guess it's something that touched off the wire services was the fact that so many people were seeing them at one time up in Michigan in the Hillsdale, the Ann Arbor area, correct? Yes, and this I in think itself it was the uh, nearness to Ann Arbor and the University of Michigan and the radio telescope site uh, that probably did it, plus mm -hmm. the, uh, the fact that uh, Bud Van Horn was one of the witnesses and the uh, deputy sheriff. Gentlemen, we've just been joined by Streeter Stewart here of WBZ News and also a member of NICAP. Streeter, we're currently talking about the fact that this flap out in Michigan, at least from, from the shows we have been doing here on Contact, seems to be a rather big one, and I guess from people interested in this thing, a rather important one, correct? Yes, I think so. I think the reports have said that uh, the reports were the most consistent that they had had by a large number of people in a long time. However, uh, Dr. Hynek's report that it was probably swamp gas will probably put a, a damper on that. Uh, he didn't say that it positively was swamp mm -hmm. gas, but uh, from uh, all indications, as far as he could find out, he thought that it was swamp gas arising uh, now in the springtime because it was uh, rather warm and mm -hmm. these people were seeing clouds of swamp gas. We'll hear portions of that statement a little bit later on. Here we have Bud Van Horn. He's the civil defense director out in Hillsdale for Hills Hillsdale County. And he saw, has seen the UFOs. In fact, he's watched one last night. I wonder, do you uh, go along with the theory of Mr. Van Horn that it would be gas out there that caused it? Definitely not, Bob. Very definitely not. Mm -hmm. 
Bob, I would like to ask uh, Mr. Van Horn uh, why he didn't report this to the nearest Air Force and uh, have them send some planes over to investigate what this thing actually was while he uh, watched it from 11 until 2. Uh, because on the previous reports to Selfridge Air Force Base, I have received very poor reception and be, have been made to look like a very uh, ignorant person. And this occurred last night, for your information, and uh, this information shall be released in the near future. You mean the, the recent sighting last night? Right. What, what did it look like? Can you give us an indication of it? Uh, yes, Ken Bob. Mm -hmm. It was one of the most perfect sightings that uh, we have had in the last 10 years that I have been receiving these reports and tracking them down. The object was long in shape. Now this is a different uh, shape than I have ever been able to determine before and I think the reason for it was that it was closer to the surface of the earth. I estimated the altitude of this at approximately 18,000 feet. Have you seen them before? You said that I've been able to estimate before. Pardon? Have you seen them at other times? Yes, I have seen them many a times. And uh, I have not bothered to report them to any agency because I did not feel that the Air Force was interested in them. Mm -hmm. How many times have you seen them in the last week or so out there? Oh, we've seen many of them, Bob. Many of them. I can't tell you how many. Mm -hmm. But how many have you seen them every night? You've been watching them? Pardon? Have you been seeing them every night out there? Uh, not every night because, uh, uh, really, I haven't been watching for them every night. There has there's hardly a night that has gone by I would say in the last two weeks that I have not received a reporting of a UFO. Don't you think this is rather a serious situation where there isn't enough liaison between the civil defense and the county and the Air Force, uh, particularly where civil defense is uh, so uh, concerned about uh, what these might be and the Air Force supposedly also being concerned, especially with anything that might be a threat to our security? Right. Just let me relate to you what happened last night. This is really an exclusive because I have not uh, released it to any uh, information uh, mm -hmm. uh, to newspaper or radio media today. Uh, is it all right if I do this, Bob? You run ahead. Uh, I observed this after following a report of this having followed a train between the small village of Allen and the city of Hillsdale last night. And uh, the train, I tried very hard to convince the uh, engineer who reported it that it was an aircraft, possibly. Uh, after listening to him and finding that this was going alongside the train and then speeded up to a great speed, uh, it uh, then stopped and the train, which was a freight train, was able to come up to it again. It hoovered in the air and uh, came further to the city of Hillsdale and then took off. Mm -hmm. They sighted it, followed it, and they immediately phoned me, and I immediately got on it. Uh, at that time uh, that I got on it, I was able to uh, visually, with the naked eye, see this object in the sky. It uh, appeared to be uh, elongated, and at the top, it had a green light, or a blue, which is sometimes referred to, in the center was a white light, and on the bottom was a red light. And uh, upon viewing this, I then put the binoculars on it, which brought it up uh, very plain, and uh, it still appeared to be elongated, and uh, through the binoculars, which were 7 by 50s uh, appeared to be about the length, uh, maybe a little longer than the length of a common pin. I immediately called Selfridge Air Force Base in attempt to get the radar uh, confirmation on this and uh, was given the runaround. Uh, I asked why a chase plane couldn't be put off the ground into the air to check this out. Uh, the answer that I got was they were not authorized. I ended up getting my confirmation on this, which I did get the confirmation on it, uh, through Willow Run Airport uh, radar, they and had not a military radar site. They had this on, uh, sighted on radar then? They had a flight. Right. We have a confirmation of this. We got a inanimate blip on it, and also we got the second. There was two of them there. And to go a little further, and to tell you merely that I witnessed 
the docking and separation of two of these in the air last night. That's all I will say. Well, Bob, this really is a fantastic development, and this is uh, the, the, this is news that I hadn't heard uh, on any news wire or from any source whatsoever. I have not released this. I will suppress all information from now on. I will not release any information whatsoever to anybody. Uh, this is uh, this is an exclusive for you, Bob. Okay, fine. Thank you so much. I'd be very interested in Dick Hall's reaction to that, and then we have lots of people waiting to join us on our long distance line and our local line. Rather, we got so many lines out of here. I'm getting mixed up. On our local line, the people of Boston, because we'll be on the long-distance line with Major Kehoe, also with that reporter out there, Daniel Campbell, reporter at the Ypsilanti Press in Ypsilanti, Michigan, who has interviewed many of the eyewitnesses. Trader Stewart, our guest here in Boston on our long-distance line in Washington, is the assistant director of NICAP, Dick Hall, in Michigan, on a special conference call with Bud Van Horn, the civil defense director for Hillsdale County out there. We heard quite a startling story from... Bob Van Horn, Dick, what was your reaction to that before we get to some calls here in Boston? Well, I think it's a very impressive report, and I'm glad to get uh, some of the details directly from uh, Bud Van Horn. Uh, we had heard rumors about this, and we're glad to hear it uh, confirmed. We have had similar reports uh, in the past of objects joining up uh, in the air, and I think his uh, description of it as a docking operation is very interesting. You know something that I'd uh, like to talk with Major Kehoe about a little bit later, but I, I was intrigued by finding out that the Republican leader of the House, Senator Ford, has called uh, Representative Ford, isn't it? Is it Representative Ford? Uh, Gerald, Ford. Gerald Ford, I don't know that uh, uh, Republican leader, House Republican leader, has to be Representative, of course. Gerald Ford called for a full-blown investigation of unidentified flying object sightings. This is something that... Major Kehoe's been talking about for quite a few uh, years. Bob? Yes, sir. Uh, Major Kehoe just came in, so I'll turn it over to him. Okay, fine. Major Kehoe. Major, how are you? Hi, Bob. Fine. Peter Stewart's with us here in Boston, too. Oh, say hello for me. You can say hello to him. He's right here. Oh, how are you, Major? <laughs> Good to have you with us. And, of course, Major, on our long-distance line out in Michigan is the Civil Defense Director of Hillsdale County, Bud Van Horn. I'd like, a little bit later, if you don't mind, I, because I want to take some phone calls, talk about House Republican Leader Ford's statement today that he'd like to see a full-blown investigation of UFOs. Yes. Okay, right now, let's take a call. Bob Kennedy, you're on contact, you're on the air. Hello? Yes, ma'am. This is Watson calling from West Peabody. Yes. In regard to a sighting my husband saw in Judea. Mm -hmm. He was driving along in Judea, uh, and he saw it with a friend of his, a neighbor. When was this? Uh, Monday night. Mm -hmm. And uh, they came across... Police cruisers and uh, police stopped naturally. Mm -hmm. It was a matter, and they saw a cigar shaped object hovering over where the review airport used to be. And my next door neighbor, who happened to have a camera in the car, took a picture. Now, mm -hmm. for reasons of his own, he has declined to show the picture to anybody. And I was wondering if anybody would be interested in the picture. Would you show it to or what do you do about this? Sure, bring it in here. <laughs> We'd be very interested in seeing it. It's a beautiful photograph. And then I'm sure Streeter would like to take a look at it as a representative of my camp and we'll get to the right hand. But uh, why don't you have your husband drop it off? All right. Okay. Radio. Right, and we guarantee anonymity. All right. Just drop it off and no questions asked. All right, thank okay. you Okay, well, well, thank you for calling. Got your picture, Streeter. Bob Kennedy, you're in contact now. You're on the air. Hi. Hey. Hi, I'd like to direct my question to Major Kia. Yes, sir. And I'd like to know uh, his opinion on the fact why, whenever the uh, uh, a sighting of UFOs is reported to the Air Force, why the Air Force very rarely reports its findings uh, to the to the public, because you find a number of the times the Air Force keeps quiet on them. They never uh, hardly ever report the findings to the public, although they get do get national press coverage, but the Air Force never comments on them. All right, Major. Well, uh, there is a, a high-level policy which the Air Force carries out. Uh, but these things must be played down, uh, explained as possible, uh, to avoid uh, hysteria, perhaps panic. Uh, the Air Force really should not be blamed too much for this. This policy is set at a very high level, and uh, there are many people in the Air Force that don't even believe in it. I think that it's, it's bound to cause trouble uh, sooner or later. But uh, under that policy, all of the project people and the Air Force spokesmen and uh, the press desk uh, officers are required to explain as many things they can, even though some of the answers are obviously uh, bordering on the ridiculous. Mm -hmm. All right, Bob Kennedy, you're on the air. You're in contact. Hello, Hello Mr. Kennedy. Yes, sir. 
Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that I'm, I'm a believer, but you and Major Keogh over the past few months have made my wife a real believer. Uh-uh. And, uh... You know, I, something, I, I don't know, Major Keogh, I'm not a believer. I, I, don't, I, I don't think I'm one of the initiated. I'm not one of the born-again believers and you folks. I, I kind of sit here, hopefully, with somewhat of a, a cynic's attitude about this. I think that's my job. Well, um, true, yeah. But I, I'm just, I, if I were so interested, I would be very concerned with people using the word believer because it almost has that mystical Well, uh, maybe it's wishful thinking then, right? Well, I don't know if that's it, but uh, Streeter, do you, does it bother you when people say, I am a believer in? Uh, it really doesn't bother me. I think what they really what? mean is that I think that these things are real and I think that there is something to it, that they're not just marsh gas and so on. Yeah. Right. Well, I had two comments I'd like some expert opinion on, if I could. Sure. Uh, I'm calling from Cape Cod. All right. And uh, the first one is I've read articles about, oh, by prominent scientists, I think, at least they say they are, from Harvard and other places, who say uh, that they've gathered from passages, uh, not directly from the Bible, but, oh, things like the Rosetta Stone, but not exact, I'm not uh, saying the Rosetta Stone itself, things they've translated mm-hmm. uh, from recorded history that people back then uh, oh, talked about the great fire bird that came from the sky and the little golden man that jumped out of it and looked around and got back in his fire bird and in a great blast of fire took off. And the scientists said that they, they thought possibly we had been visited, our planet had been visited and watched over uh, something like, uh, oh, something like a, you would watch over a garden uh, pretty regularly for the past, oh, maybe five, ten thousand years. Mm-hmm. I'd like some comment on that. And also, I guess I'm the only one that saw it, but I remember when the first uh, pictures that the Russians sent back from the moon, the back side of the moon, I don't know whether it was a photography blur or what it was, it seemed to be a little spike sticking up. And since the moon has no uh, high mountains on it that, that are discernible from where we sit, mm-hmm. or from the pictures, uh, of course I told my wife and some of the immediate family that wouldn't think I was a complete crackpot that, well, this guy had also said, when we send somebody to the back of the moon, don't be surprised to find an observation station there that has been built by these people, uh, maybe from another part of the galaxy or something else, because what more perfect place than a place which never turns around and faces the Earth? And those are just the two things that uh, I'd like to know if... uh, uh, maybe some of the people with you there have okay. given any thought to this question at all. Sure. And uh, since you're waiting for calls, I'll hang up and see if I can get the answer. But thank, thank you. you very much. Okay. Do you have any thoughts on this? Yes. Uh, it is well known that uh, historically and archaeologically uh, there has been evidence and also the evidence uh, from the Bible that there have been uh, things which some people have said were unidentified flying objects which came from outer space and visited the Earth. There were drawings, for example, that are reported to have been from uh, several thousand years B.C., which showed uh, creatures with very large heads and very small uh, legs and arms, which some have said were an indication that these were creatures from outer space and not worldly creatures. The uh, wheel that Ezekiel tells about seeing in the Bible, some people say uh, was a a vehicle from outer space. Uh, Dr. Menzel of Harvard says that he thinks that probably it was some type of of a reflection, sun-dog combination, a natural phenomenon. But it is true that in the Mayan Peninsula and other areas, there have been prehistoric and historical evidences that uh, perhaps could be interpreted as UFOs. Gentlemen, let me interrupt here. We have a few messages, and then we'll be back continuing our conversation. And then, Bud, I'd be very interested in finding out if you have any particular feelings as to why. As you said a little bit earlier, the Air Force gave you somewhat of a runaround when you called them uh, as a civil defense director out there in Hillsdale County. If you have any feelings why they might have done that. Now, Bud Van Horn, I asked you a question before the commercials there about if you had any feeling as to why the Air Force gave you, as you call it, a runaround last season. Bob, this is uh, uh, the third uh, third reporting. The two previous uh, that I have phoned in, uh, the same thing occurred. This is why I haven't bothered to uh, waste my time <laughs> phoning any other sin. Uh, no, I can't, uh, really, I can't figure this out. They have this UFO 
investigation program. But uh, if I had to give an honest opinion, I would say it was one of two things. Either they just plain are interested, uh, every report they receive remains, re uh, means too much paperwork, or else they know what it is. But uh, as a person who is uh, interested in uh, taking care of his community, and by the way, I don't get paid for this job. It's the gratis job in the hobby to me. Uh, I feel uh, that uh, there's certainly something, should be something done. Now, last night I asked for a chase plane. If it was possible to get a chase plane on to check this out. Uh, the airman uh, that I was talking to said, no, they weren't authorized. Yeah. Well, if uh, they're intently interested in this UFO program, and they want to check these out, mm. and they don't know what they are, and they really want to find out what they are, mm. uh, to my way of thinking, there should be things that should be authorized here that uh, they can take immediate action on. Mm. Uh, really, I think uh, it's uh, very poor planning. Mm. I, uh, well, you know, uh, one thing, if, if I can kind of jump over the other side of the fence here, and Having once upon a time in my life sat inside a control center like that and gotten some phone calls, not specifically like this, but, uh, you know, it costs a good deal of money to run one of those things off the ground. It's, uh, we think, well, gee, just take a, you know, run the airplane up. I forget the cost of one time where just to get one off the ground, I think it's something like $10,000. And uh, there is always a danger of life. And, and I, uh, I guess they want to make darn certain what they're going at, and though perhaps they should do some regulation. And if, for instance, like a civil defense director calls up, about it, perhaps they should scramble on it. But on the other hand, they they really have to think about what they're running an airplane up. That's a major piece of equipment. Over, you know. Well, Bob, uh, my my feeling on this is that uh, there are many things uh, uh, done uh, where our government don't worry about uh, spending the money. And I'm sure that the uh, planes are used. Uh, in fact, uh, I know personally where uh, uh, the uh, aircraft. Uh, have been used for different various things where, uh, if you want to get right on to uh, brass facts, weren't important. Yeah. Uh, it all depends. I mean, yeah. if they're interested in this program, fine. If they aren't, why don't they say so? Okay, Bud, thank you very much for joining us. We have an edition of WBC News coming up, and we'll continue with our conference call down through to Washington and then joining us a little bit later on our long-distance line to Michigan, so we have to kind of clear the line up there. We'll be... Dan Campbell, a reporter on the Ypsilanti Press. And incidentally, in case uh, it's a good windy evening and we're getting out there to Michigan, and we have any of those people who have seen some of the uh, sightings in the past weekend would be willing to spend a little change and call us up. We'd love to hear from you. Major, we said a little bit early we'd talk about the fact that uh, Representative Ford came out today for an investigation. I imagine this makes you sort of uh, an elated man at this point. Well, uh, we know that a lot of uh, members of Congress have been supporting hearings and urging them for some time, uh, but it's, it's all this changed public attitude and press attitude uh, has encouraged some of them, and now uh, I think that Representative Ford may get some results. We certainly hope so. And a little bit later, we'll be playing a portion of the press conference that Dr. J. Allen Hynek held today, mm -hmm. the investigator from the Air Force and the Project Blue Book out there. He, of course, said that uh, the flying objects were due to luminous swamp gas. But yeah. He admitted he couldn't prove it. Did you chuckle, Major? <laughs> well, <laughs> you hear a chuckle down in Washington. Pardon, sir? You can call it a chuckle if you want to. Okay, fine. Do you have any particular theories, or have you been filtering the reports out down there about why or what or why particularly out in Michigan at this particular time? Why so many? Well, no, we haven't, uh, we haven't figured out any pattern which would give a conclusion like that, but uh, quite often there's been a concentration in a certain area over a period of time, and then uh, it ends and the concentration begins somewhere else. Now, for a long time there was, a, there was one up there in New England, and now it seems to be shifting uh, over into the Middle West. But there's not enough sightings to... Uh, to reach a conclusion on it, I would say perhaps this goes on for a month while we should have a lot more information. Before we take another phone call, see, there was something that Dr. Heineck said in his report today, and I'm not a, certainly not an expert on this, but it, it seemed, frankly, a rather thin reason as to why it would not be flying south. He said he, he couldn't see why they would pick a swamp. You know, just, just why? You know, why not? That's <laughs> something I would want if they're looking for a quiet kind of place. Well, I think his reasoning was that uh, no sensible pilot, as we know them here on Earth, would, uh, whether he was a helicopter pilot, a plane pilot, a uh, pilot of anything that flies, would pick a swamp as a place to actually land. But actually, uh, you know, uh, many of these UFOs 
seem to hover rather than land. And if they picked out a swamp where people are uh, not expecting this and where they wanted some privacy while they did some observing or gathering some specimens or the like, uh, perhaps uh, a swamp would be an ideal place for them to, uh, to so-called hover or come close to land. Stranger, I bet there are any number of people asking this question. I have asked it so many times that sometimes I almost forget to ask it again, but I think it's important. People who might be hearing the program tonight, they say, oh, for heaven's sake, again with those flying saucers, if they're out there, why in the world, if they're watching us and if they're down here? For heaven's sake, if they were, it would seem to me that they'd go right up to Washington, hover over the White House and say, President Johnson, here we are, we're from outer space, how are you? And end all of this controversy once and for all. Well, Bob, you know, these, uh, if, if there are intelligent creatures in the spacecraft, uh, there's no indication that these are identical to us. Mm -hmm. uh, it could very well be that uh, if, a, if a civilization has reached uh, an advanced state of technology whereby they are able to propel their spaceship at an ever-increasing acceleration, then they can travel at the speed of sound. It's not inconceivable that uh, they are willing to spend the four years in space travel that it would take from one of the, uh, uh, one of the other suns in our planetary, in our solar system, rather or outside of our solar system, but in our galaxy, that's what I really mean, uh, to come here and establish a base uh, someplace that we don't know, and then use these so-called surface ships, just as we will use a small capsule to go down to the surface of the moon, and make these exploratory uh, contacts. It could very well be that we are going to be very much surprised if they are intelligent beings in these spacecraft that uh, they're not like human beings at all. So no, their way of thinking wouldn't be the same. All right, let's take a phone call, gentlemen. Hello? Hello, yes, Bob. I would like to ask a couple of questions on NICAP. Sure. Uh, who is it uh, supported by the federal government, and is it affiliated with the Air Force? No, no. <laughs> Quick answers for you. I can do that. No affiliation with the government, no support from the government. And uh, also a question on swamp gas. Uh, how would swamp gas create an illusion of illuminated objects in the sky at night? Is there any possibility? I've heard people who have seen swamp fires. Is that what they call it? Uh, apparently, there are uh, there is a phenomenon on this. Something like the decaying matter in some logs, the so-called uh, fox fire, and uh, all kinds of these false fires. Um, this actually, uh, if it has a certain chemical content in it, a phosphorus, it will glow. I've seen this so uh, uh, evident at night in uh, decaying logs that you could take objects uh, that were uh, uh, made of this, take it into a darkened room, and it would give off a glow that you could readily see. It would almost light up a corner of the room. And if the gas is, is filled with this particular substance, it would give off an illumination. And then if it uh, came upward because of, uh, of the expansion of the gas or because of warm temperatures causing the gas to rise, this would create the, uh, the illusion of something, an object that was rising into the sky. Bob Kennedy, you're in contact, you're on the air. Hello. Good evening, Bob. Yes, sir. Yes, I have a, uh, a question. I can't remember where I heard this comment, mm -hmm. but this was on the uh, last show you did with Major Keel. Sure. But in, in the comment, it was mentioned that uh, rashes of uh, UFO sightings were usually related to certain planets in the solar system mm -hmm. being close to the Earth. Yeah, the approach of Mars. Well, I was wondering if, uh, if there were any planets close to Earth at this particular time that were under a suspicion. Okay. And also, yeah. uh, sort of a science fiction comment. Mm -hmm. About a week and a half ago, I think it was the Russians that uh, sent up a probe that did collide with Mars. And now a week or so later, you hear about all these UFOs. But, uh, I'd like to listen to you. All right. Thank you for calling. Uh, Bob, the Russian uh, one went to Venus. They did actually make a, a hard contact on Venus, and uh, we have been avoiding that because we don't want to contaminate the planet, and that's why we preferred a flyby, and we did do a flyby of Venus making observations. Unfortunately, our flyby was so far away that uh, most scientists feel that any results that we had were rather inconclusive. Uh, the, uh, what was the other the planet uh, they talking about, well, whether they were in opposition at this particular time? No, I don't believe that any are that close. Uh, however, when uh, when they are, it is true that 
not only have we had uh, a, an increase in uh, UFO activity at those times, especially when Mars is close by, but scientists have been able to discover many things, and I wish uh, uh, Donald Kehoe would uh, talk a little bit about uh, the report in the UFO investigator about the uh, confirmation of the canals of Mars. Major? Well, yes, the, uh, you know, the first reports were released, it was stated uh, out of Jet Propulsion Laboratory that there was absolutely no sign of any of the so-called canals or oases, uh, the areas where the canal lines intersect. Uh, now, it turns out that there actually are lines on these films, on a number of them. Uh, matter of fact, we have seen two of these films here in the office, so they were shown to us by Dr. Frank Salisbury. Uh, who is an eminent exiled biologist at uh, uh, State University of Colorado, and who has also studied Mars for a long time and uh, strongly suggests that there may be intelligent life on Mars. Now, these were films made by the astronauts, weren't they, Major Kehoe? Uh, no, they were made by the Mariner. Remember, we, we, the Mariner flew by there and uh, took pictures from a, a distance of sp uh, several thousand miles, and uh, you couldn't expect too much detail into it, but hey, in this, but in the, on the basis of this, uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory and then NASA said there was no indication of any canals, and that idea remained fixed for a while. Now it turns out that they, there were lines on the films, and I don't know whether they, it was thought better not to mention it at the time or whether they were belatedly discovered when somebody made a more careful examination. But they are there. Dr. Uh, Pombo, they discovered the pilot for Pluto, mm -hmm. uh, also confirms the fact that uh, he's found several canals on these films. I understand, too, that there is a movement uh, underfoot to put more money into the Mars exploration and to uh, sort of dismiss or uh, not use the money that we had planned to use for the exploration of uh, Venus because it was felt that uh, there was a, a greater uh, reward to be reaped by putting all of our eggs into one basket, so to speak, in the exploration of Mars. Uh, have you heard much on that? Uh, well, I've heard that too. I don't. I don't think any actual figures have been released uh, showing a change in appropriation. But uh, uh, it, it seems reasonable because uh, Mars has indicated that there's more chance of. Uh, I mean, our evidence indicates there's more chance of some kind of intelligent life there. If it doesn't exist now, then there possibly was in the past. And I believe it's right. We would get more rewards, and uh, certainly Venus. If the, uh, all of the reports of the last two years are correct, uh, it's very doubtful whether there is any life of the type that we would recognize, at least. Gentlemen, we have a message or two, then we'll be back continuing our conversation tonight. A long-distance line from Michigan in a few minutes will be Daniel Campbell. As a reporter on the Ypsilanti Press, the man has been interviewing many of the people who have sighted some of these objects. Yes, sir. Hi, Bob. Nice to be with you. Nice to be with you, too. I enjoy your show very much. Thank you so much. Listen, I have two very brief things. Number one, uh, my hobby, one of my hobbies is uh, old newspapers and old books. And as a result, I have quite a collection of them. I spend considerable time in the libraries, uh, one in particular, the Boston Public Library. And today, by a strange coincidence, I was reading a newspaper, uh, an actual newspaper, the original copy of a thing called the Athenian Mercury which was published in London in 1692. Mm -hmm. This paper consists of letters to the editor and answers. And uh, the fascinating thing about it was that on the front page there were two flying saucer sites. And uh, this fellow went on to say he was standing by the ocean somewhere there in uh, England. Did, they didn't call them flying saucers. No, they didn't. They, they called them flying dishes. But I thought that was pretty close. Flying dishes. Well. Flying dishes. <laughs> and he went on to describe in perfect detail pretty much what you'd read in today's papers about uh -huh. a thing wheeling in and then going at great speed and then uh, making sharp turns and disappearing. And the answer, of course, the question was, what is it? And the answer simply was that, well, over the years, we have had many such sightings of flying axe handles, flying anvils, and all the flying paraphernalia that was popular at that time in history. And that was all there was to it, but I thought it was kind of interesting. Just flying dishes. Now, the second thing, and this is something that's bothered me and concerned me for quite some time, have you noticed how the general public in the country seems to be alone in this flying saucer thing? Now, you, you take something like the sales tax, the Vietnam crisis, where people who are very, very vocal, I mean people in the uh, news media, the Walter Lippmann, the uh, Cronkite, uh, Huntley Brinkley, they all take definite stands. 
the newspapers write editorials. Some of my best reporters come out for it. But in trying sources, what you generally get is straight reporting, and there doesn't seem to be a reporter, really, a major stature, of national stature, who has yet to take a definite stand on this. There's been no clamor from your so-called big people for a national investigation. It's sort of a tongue-in-cheek. Even the newspaper reporting got right. Representative Ford ends up this afternoon clamoring for an investigation. Agreed. Uh, and this is a little bit unique, but over the past few years, and I have a feeling that Representative Ford uh, seems kind of alone in this as well. Mm. Uh, your big network, the NBC, CBS, they'll do specials on, on so many things. Uh, the Watts the problem in uh, Los Angeles, uh, uh, unemployment situation, but yet a thing of the magnitude of possibility of extraterrestrial visitors has drawn a blank. Well, they have done special programs on UFOs. Yes, they, they have. have. They have had a, a movie, which uh, I think was kind of a bomb, but I mean, that's beside the point. It, it just there hasn't been enough of it. I get the feeling that an awful lot of people who are sort of, you might consider in the know, the spokesmen for the country, for radio, for television, yeah. for newspapers, are kind of either shying away or they don't believe in it at all. I frankly, if, if I can uh, talk perhaps from the inside, I don't think that they're shying away from it. I, I frankly think that it's because um, a large percentage of people who would be involved in this really don't, don't believe. They think it's too far out to have any fact, and they treat it as sort of a, a, a feature type of thing. In fact, I think, Peter, that this is probably the first time that that uh, uh, flying saucer sightings have made such extensive hard news, as we call it, you know. They, they, uh, that's the word I was looking yeah, for. Yeah, rather than someone writing about the funny little farmer who saw the three men <laughs> jumped out and said, take it to your leader, you know, or, or, or something like that. Uh, the first time I, I recall, they usually freak stories, but nothing like this. Is that right, Stephen? Well, there have been other times, it seems yeah. to me, when they have in the past, uh, and at that time, of course, we gave more emphasis to it, and then uh, after a passage of time, you don't recall how exciting and how uh, much coverage there really was mm -hmm. to these, and I think that, that would explain that. But I do believe that, uh, that a lot of people feel that anyone who thinks that things could come from outer space is a kind of a nut. Uh, yes. And and yet, if you uh, if you realize that we do really plan in our own lifetime to uh, make uh, man exploration to the planet, uh, even though it uh, seems almost impossible that we would ever think of sending a spaceship to another solar system, uh, since it would take four light years, that is traveling at 186,000 miles a second. Still, uh, I think one of these days, Bob, we're going to do that. Gentlemen, let's take another phone call. Yes, Bob. Yes, sir. I just thought I might be able to shed a little light on the discussion about the Air Force. I just got out after seven and a half years, and I've had uh, taken these UFO reportings personally. Mm -hmm. And the fellow in Minnesota seemed to be a little perturbed about the Air Force maybe not caring or giving them the runaround. Yeah. And uh, I think the main the main thing here is that uh, when they get a hold of somebody at an Air Force site or base like that, uh, they're talking to usually, like he said, an airman or a lower grade man who. Uh, hasn't the authority to do anything, and usually nobody on the whole site or base has the authority to do anything. They can't determine who's calling in if he says he's a civil defense director. They have no way of proving this, and by the time everything's checked out, of course, it's too late. Uh, they definitely do care, I know, and uh, if something is spotted on radar, whether we get a call or not, it is checked out. Uh, not always released, but checked out. Uh, the thing is, how can you write a regulation governing something like this to cover the whole Air Force. It's kind of a, a little difficult. And uh, you run into a, this situation like he did. He probably got a hold of a lower grade man who had a regulation in front of him and all he could do was read the regulation to him and uh, maybe sympathize with him. I do think, Bob, that it's unfortunate that this is, this is set up in this particular way because uh, uh, since this is the case, they have to always do an investigation after the fact, rather than being yeah. able to send a plane there and actually observing and finding out for sure what this thing is. And uh, this leads to a lot of speculation as to what it might have been, and if they can get some pretty good uh, expert witness to say that it probably was so-and-so, then they mark the case off as solved. I remember one night we were sitting at a radar site, this was in Germany, Streeter, and uh, after you've been sitting at a radar site for about five months with <laughs> not a darn thing going on, you know, you're just hoping for something to happen. At about three o'clock in the morning, and we got these glitches coming across the scope, and we figured them out that they were going 18,000 miles an hour. They were just booming down, they were covering Germany and back off uh, through Italy and down like nothing flat. 
had that we really didn't know what to do about it, frankly. And the captain in charge uh, looked at those things that we called headquarters, and they were sort of half-heartedly kind of debating, uh, should we go up? In other words, they were in a position, if we admit we have to go up, we admit there's something up there, and if there's something up there and it's going 18,000 miles an hour, maybe we don't want to find out what it is. And then we were wondering if it was a rocket, and then suddenly somebody came back. I, they had dropped a screwdriver and the, you know, the equipment in the back, and it caused this, this blitz to come along like that. A little bit earlier today, there was a press conference held, and I gather it was probably held out in Michigan. Let's see what the dateline on this is. Here in Detroit, and this is Dr. J. Allen Hennig, Northwestern University astrophysicist and the Air Force consultant. And he was sent out there this week to investigate the situation. And you'll hear him in the beginning say, I'm talking only about these two sightings, and by that he means only the, the two series of sightings that they had out there in Detroit, and not the rest of the many sightings that we have had in our country over the past few months, indeed over the past year. And here's just a portion of that. It's not the best quality at all, but it'll give you an indication of what the gentleman has to say. I've been talking about these two particular cases. And I think, honestly, they're not bad. Uh, I am not discussing the hundreds of other cases which certainly could not be explained by Moscow. You can turn to this year's time. Some of these are uh, intended to investigate further. I'm talking only about these two cases, and I want to keep that quite clear. The light, she says, resembles tiny flames, sometimes seen right in the ground, sometimes floating above it. The flames go out in one place and suddenly appear and not in another, giving the illusion of motion. No heat is felt, the lights do not burn or char the ground. They can appear for hours, with all the quotations, appear for hours at a time and sometimes for a whole night. Generally there is no snow and really no sound except the popping sound of little explosions such as when a gas then ignites. The majority of observers in both cases have reported only lights, red, yellow, and green, silent, glowing lights near the ground. They have not described an object. Even the only two observers who did describe an object have stated that they were no closer than 500 yards, better than a quarter of a mile. Now, I doubt that one could make out much detail at that distance at night. It was a dark night, no moon, and by the way, the winds were fairly calm. And I have recommended in my capacity of scientific consultant that competent scientists quietly study such cases when evidence from responsible people appears to warrant such study. Dr. J. Allen Hynek, Northwestern University astrophysicist and an Air Force consultant, the man was sent by the Air Force out to Michigan to investigate the sightings this past week. Matthew attributes them pretty much to luminous swamp gas. A couple of messages, and we'll be back talking more about the big flight in Michigan. Yes, sir. Bob. Yes. I wanted something. Now, sure. um, I'd like to ask Mr. Kilo a question. Sure. Now, this gentleman said he call the Air Force and try to get the plane up. Yeah. Uh, how come this uh, radar in Colorado can't pick it up? If they say there's FOs up there. And then I have another question. Uh, uh, they said that they said the uh, boy in Maine had sighted one and he shot at it today. Yeah. Could I have an answer on that? Okay, well, he, he, he sure took a shot at it. He fired at it four times. He missed three. Hit it once. Doesn't say too much for his aim. I don't know about the UFO. Major Kehoe, what about the, the, the first thing? Did they, any Was there anything picked up in any major radar sites uh, on the... Well, uh, according to the Civil Defense Director Van Horn, I think he told you that uh, yeah. the A radar at Willow Run uh, confirmed the fact that they had two breadth in his last sighting. But uh, there have been many cases where the Air Force, as a matter of policy in playing this down, has said there was no radar confirmation, and then later it, uh, they had to retract and admit that they did have it. Now, that happened last summer out in Oklahoma. The uh, Oklahoma State Police, and we have signed reports from their headquarters saying that they did have confirmation from the Air Force. Take Air Force Base in Charleston. Uh, many times that these objects were sighted out there, and they were tracked by radar. They had height, the altitudes, the speeds, maneuvers, and so on. And yet the Air Force gave the public a statement that there was no radar tracking. And you simply have to accept it as a part of the policy to play these things down. Now, I'd like to just say something about the matter of the radar tracking. 
uh, in, in the Boston area, when I made what I thought was a, a very good sighting, uh, I called all around and got confirmation at all from any of the observatories, and uh, none of the uh, radar stations in this area had said that they had uh, reported it at all. And the object that I saw at the very time that I saw it and at the, in the very direction that I saw it, uh, doing the things that uh, I had seen, was tracked from Fort Monmouth in New Jersey. So this thing was apparently very high. But uh, as far as I could determine, no radar in the Boston area had tracked it. Now let's go on to Michigan once again. On our line is Daniel Campbell. Mr. Campbell, welcome to Contact. Thank you, Bob. And welcome to Boston. Streeter Stewart's with us here. Streeter, in addition to being uh, one of our WBZ newsmen, is also a member of NICAT. Of course, you have Major Keo on the other end of the line. Now, you have not at such seen any of the sponsors, have you? No, I have not. I've been out three different evenings with uh, sheriff's mm -hmm. deputies, but I have, has not, I have not yet seen anything. What time do they usually appear? We've had them appear anywhere from 7.30 um, in the evening until uh -huh. about the same time in the morning. Fine, it's about 7. You're on the same time as we are here, correct? Yeah, Eastern Standard Time. 7.30, you want to stick your head out the window? You don't see anything now, do you? Anything reported out there this evening? Uh, no, we haven't had anything recorded this evening that I know of, but we had a, quite a flurry uh, last evening. What kind of a flurry? Can you give us a little detail on it? We had 200 students at the Eastern Michigan University uh, claim they saw... Uh, two objects, not two objects, but two lights in the sky, mm -hmm. uh, one to the east and one to the west of the campus, that's an Ypsilanti. And this was confirmed by Milan Police, uh, the campus police, and the Ypsilanti Police Department. We also have statements from these men uh, stating that they also saw the lights. What, in addition to saying they just look like lights, gives you an indication that they were UFO or they just looked like lights, could have been things on an airplane or some sort of an advertising balloon going by, any one of a number of things? Well, we talked to about 15 of the students mm -hmm. this afternoon, and uh, all of them have uh, concurred with the fact that the lights um, were stationary. We had students that say they watched them for 10 minutes. We have another that said they watched it for an hour and a half. The lights changed from red to green to white uh, in order, then back to red, green, and white. Were, they, were the colors bright? I mean, was, was it a they said about as bright as a bright star. Yeah, but I mean, the, the colors themselves, they said red to green to white. Were, were the changes distinguishable changes or just sort of shading, vague changes? No, they said they were changing almost mm -hmm. uh, as if two lights, two different colored lights had been put on a uh, policeman's mm -hmm. uh, light on his car and then the flasher. And they were flashing in different colors. And then all three lights would change. All three of them would change every two seconds. So the intervals were that fast. You also talked to the farmer. Was his name Manners? Yes, Frank Manners. He and his son saw one of these things hover or land? Yes. He and saw it uh, hover, I believe. Mm -hmm. How close was he to it? He got, uh, as the papers have said, and as I heard on your program, to about 1,500 mm -hmm. feet. But I would not agree with uh, Dr. Heinick that that is a great distance because I, too, have been out on the site. And from the vantage point that Mr. Manor had, um, one would have a very clear vision of anything at that distance. I myself, I think, uh, judging this distance, uh, tried it, marked it off, was able to tell the year, make, and model of various cars uh, from that distance. So that isn't such a great distance. What kind of an attitude pervades the communities out there? How are the newspapers handling this as uh, straight news or sort of doing it up in feature style, little tongue-in-cheek, or what? Mostly straight news. Uh, we've had a few feature stories on it. Every once in a while, something will happen that will lend itself to humor, and the papers will pick it up. But generally, it's straight news. Uh, we've had just too much out here to laugh at anymore. All right, gentlemen, let's take some phone calls. Hello, Bob. Yes. Uh, I was, I'd like to ask a question to Major Kehoe, if I may, about a case that happened on October 23rd, 1965, uh, out in, in Minnesota where an announcer at K-E-Y-L, Long Prairie, Minnesota, supposedly saw robots or creatures shaped like tin cans with arms and cycloid legs. No, you can watch those announcers. They see all sorts of things. Look out for it. <laughs> appearing to be uh, fle not flesh or tissue, but a kind of metal. Is this, uh, how does he account for this? Major Kehoe, do you hear anything about that? Uh, yes, we have. Actually, the evidence is rather sketchy. 
And uh, we, we are putting it on the question uh, mark list. Actually, you take the thing like that, and uh, you have to have fairly good proof. Uh, there should be several witnesses who saw that same thing and get the same dimensions. I believe that you would have to say that that is one of the unconfirmed reports. Gentlemen, let me sell a loaf of rye bread here in Boston, and we'll be back taking more of our phone calls. Oh, before we forget again, Streeter, by golly, what about the, the young man who mentioned the fact that he uh, that, that fellow up in Maine was just like a pot shot out of flying saucer? Yes, I thought maybe uh, Major Kehoe would have something to say about people who mm -hmm. shoot at these UFOs. Major? Well, we were concerned about the fellow who took a pot shot at the flying saucer. Oh, yes. Well, that has happened several times, yeah. and we've been concerned about it, too. Uh, over the past year, there have been reports of people uh, who were alarmed by these things and either dived out of their cars from them that came down at rather low altitude or uh, actually fired at them. One case in West Virginia where a man had, uh, had a gun in his car, and he jumped out and shot at it. But we haven't any reports of uh, they were actually hitting them. Why did you say we were concerned about that? Well... You can, if you start that kind of feeling, you can spread uh, alarm, and there's actually no basis to feel fear of these objects, so far as we've found out. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no evidence of any hostility, and I think we should look at them uh, more uh, calmly and try to get as much scientific information as we can, and impress people with the fact that there's not been any attack, there's been no hostility, and... Uh, there's a great deal that can be learned if these are actually machines from some other and more advanced civilization. So from NICAP's point of view, somebody up there likes us? No, I think that uh, we we don't know what motive could be back of these. It could just simply be something the Air Force itself years ago uh, suggested in the Project Guts report. Uh, that uh, an advanced civilization was concerned because we were now preparing to go into space. We were launching high altitude rockets. We were exploding nuclear bombs, and uh, they wanted to check and see whether we were likely to be any sort of a problem if we did get out of space. Bob, I like uh, Jacques Vallée's uh, idea in the book uh, Anatomy of a Phenomenon, in which he suggests that there has been enough evidence now, and it's about time that uh, a group of scientists actually uh, got to work on this as a project, putting their heads together, not just one man going out and interviewing a few people over a few hours, but... Uh, really working on this to find out if there is something to the UFOs, if they really are from outer space, and, and coming up with an answer as to what they are. Daniel Campbell, before we close down our line to Michigan tonight, are you going to be out doing any investigating this evening? Um, I hope not. I was out all last night. Well, how many more people do you plan on interviewing out there? Oh, at least a couple dozen. We're going down to Hillsdale, uh, mm -hmm. another NICAP member in Ann Arbor and myself tomorrow. I would think uh, that if uh, you knew that this thing had been spotted over a particular swamp area and uh, this, this had uh, occurred a couple of nights in a row, that uh, it would be an excellent idea to go back there on uh, two or three nights to see if you didn't see that again. And if you did have some expert uh, people with you, you could actually see it with your own eyes and come to some kind of a consensus. Okay, Dan, good night. Thank you for joining us. Good night. What station do you work for? WBRJ, Marietta, Ohio. Okay, very good. What do you do out there? Program director. Oh, the boss. Oh, the boss. I'm straight up. Here's the program director. Okay, do you have a question, though? I was uh, wondering, I suppose uh, Major Keo is uh, the one that I really uh, was wondering about. Um, I have heard that back during World War II that uh, the... Army and Air Force were interested in the flying saucer situation uh, pretty much undercover, and of course they don't say too much about it nowadays, but uh, I heard that uh, they went so far as to have diffraction grading cameras stationed in some of their uh, Air Force bases hoping to get a picture and uh, diffraction grading being similar to a prism giving some sort of spectrum analysis. Uh, well, the line is, is really cocky on here if you spend all that money. Well, uh, I think we better get questions. Were you curious to know why uh, they did it? I was one? wondering if uh, Major Keogh had any information on this, if, uh, if this was uh, official or what... Uh, okay, fine, but we'll let Major Keogh answer that for you. I'm sorry the line is so bad. Thank you for calling. 
Nathan? Uh, yes, they did have an official project. It was announced uh, about 1951 or 52 uh, for these uh, special cameras with the grids, and it turned out to be uh, a failure. They, several times the grids came off, they weren't cemented right, they had to be taken back in and worked on them again. They never did turn up anything, uh, main reason because they weren't the right type of equipment, and there was no real uh, campaign to use these things. As far as I know, they didn't register a single UFO. Major Kehoe, once again, thank you very much for joining us tonight on Contact. Thank you, Bob. Nice to have you back with us. Kind of an exciting week for you, I imagine, huh?